I would like to tell you from my own experience, you know, I was most impressed with the Buddha's words when he accepted women to be ordained on the reason that women can be enlightened. You know, he said that, oh, they can enter into this Sotapanna, uh, Sakatakami, Anakami, Arahat, Satchika Tunti. They can see it with their, their own eyes. That is the golden phrase that the Buddha said. And that was the reason why he allowed women to be ordained. Well, you know, uh, this goes according to the Buddha's teaching, Anijang Tukkang Anatta, you know, uh, things that rises also fall. That also happened with not only Pikuni Sangha, but also Pikku Sangha. In India, it disappeared around 12th century B AD uh, with, the invasion, with the invasion of the Turk Muslim that came to invade India at that time. At the same time, in Sri Lanka, the year was exactly 1017. The South Indian king went over to Sri Lanka and invaded Sri Lanka. So the two countries, they were supporting each other when both places, both Pikus and Pikunis died out. So they could not support each other. In Sri Lanka, they finally got the lineage from Thai monk. So they could revive the Pikus, but not the Pikunis. That's how they disappeared. Yes, what, what we got stuck, we misunderstood the text by saying that, oh, when a pikuni is ordained, if you want to ordain a woman as a pikuni, you have to have pikuni sangha, and then pikuni, pikku sangha. When you start like this, they cannot start because we don't have pikunis, mm -hmm. you know. So, in fact, when you go back and read the text, mm -hmm. the ordination for pikunis is given by the pikku sangha. Mm -hmm. And... So it can be done again as long as you have Pikku Sangha. In Nepal, you have Theravada Pikku Sangha. They agree together. Suppose if you have 300 of them, maybe 100 of them do not, do not agree yet. But if 200 of them agree, Sangha is only five. You know, five monks, 10 monks can go ahead, can go ahead and train the women. Give the, uh, give the seminary ordination first. Let them practice for two years. And then after that, when they are well trained, give them full ordination to become pikuni. You know, uh, in Thailand, the, the movement for, to become pikuni started as early as 1928, but it was not successful. The women who were ordained at that time were even put into prison. And they could not wear the rope. They pulled the rope from her body, can you imagine? So very drastic. 1971, my own mother was ordained. But at that time, there was no Theravada ordination. So she went to Taiwan. The, the ordination she got was from Dhammayut, sorry, was from uh, Dharma Gupta, Dharma Gupta Vinaya which is not Theravada. So when she came back to Thailand, she was a Pikuni, but she could not give ordination to the next generation. And I realized that if you get the lineage from Taiwan, you cannot start Theravada ordination in your country. So when my turn came, Theravada ordination started to be accepted only after 1998. Mm -hmm. This is when Fo Kuang San organized it in Bodh Gaya and 20 of the nuns from Sri Lanka went there. Sri Lanka was the only country that the, the senior monks were prepared to be involved. So this is very unique character. Uh, senior monks were prepared to be involved from the very beginning. They screened out, they screened, screened the most capable nuns from Sri Lanka. And the monks took these nuns, 20 candidates, to be ordained. When they were ordained, the monks thought that if they come back to Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan people will not accept because the lineage is Dharma Gupta, not Theravada. So the senior monks took them to, took the candidates, now they're ordained as Pichuni, took them to Sarnath, took them to Sarnath and gave them Theravada ordination. This is how Theravada lineage got started in the modern time, 1998. Mm -hmm. So I was ordained from the Pikunis who took this ordination. Mm -hmm. My ordination, my full ordination was done in two, 2003. 
I was first ordained as seminary first, 2001. So this is possible now. Yes, starting from this 1998, it is acceptance by academic and by Dharma Vinaya. We check the Vinaya and we find that this Vinaya is correct, correct. I myself, I'm academic, waiting for the right ordination to happen. So I agree, I checked and I studied 1998 ordination. That's why I took ordination from this, from this one, from this 1998, from the teachers who were ordained in 1998. Then from there, uh, there were uh, candidates from Thailand, from Myanmar, from Vietnam, from Indonesia, started to become ordained, also from this lineage from this new Theravada Pikuni lineage. We started forming network, network of Theravada Pikunis in Asia. Depends on each country. I start with Vietnam first. Vietnam, uh, majority of the nuns in that country is Mahayana. Actually, they have the largest Mahayana nuns in the world, 22,000, uh, as opposed to 12,000, 12,000 monks and 22,000 Pikuni but that is in Mahayana. The Theravada started very new. The first, the first batch was ordained in 2002. Remember, I was ordained in 2003, so we are kind of together. You know, they were ordained just one year before me. But after ordination, she was still doing her PhD, so she had to go back and finish her, her work. And then she came back. She was supported by her teacher, who is a senior Theravada monk in Vietnam. So when she came back, she already has a temple, a temple for her to continue. So in the beginning, to keep the Vinaya, very strict to the Vinaya, when you receive Katina, you have to have Pikuni Sangha stay together. Only towards the end of the uh, Vasa, only then you can receive Katina. But there were just two of them. So what they did, they invited us, you know. So we sent the Thai Pikunis to Vietnam to stay together to complete five. Then I went there three years. Every, every katina, I would go and help them because I should be the one who actually pronounced, make pronouncement in Pali that the Sangha, this year the Sangha decided to give this robe to this particular person that way. So this, this is how we try to keep the Vinaya intact. And very important, first thing we have to think about is the Sima. Sima is the boundary consecrated boundary because once when you become pikuni you have you must be five again five together then you recite patimok and the reciting patimok must be done in the sima so it's just not ordination and come back not like that you know you have to know what need to be prepared beforehand indonesia is a muslim country you imagine 300 million muslim only one percent are buddhist so, but among this 1%, four of them became Pikuni in the year 2000. But when they went back there, the Theravada monks, in the whole country, they have only 50 Theravada monks. The Theravada monks did not accept them. So two of them disrobed. Only two remained, but these two continued on. But the lay people thought it was so wonderful. So they get together, bought a piece of land for them to start the temple. And now, very interesting, this land is in the middle of Muslim neighbors. But the Muslim women supported the nuns because the nuns would open the space and the, the, the Muslim women can come and sell the vegetable. So it's a very nice setting, very nice setting. And uh, two years ago, they gave another ordination, international ordination. So now they have about eight pikunis in Indonesia. I was, I was very concerned because my mother, as I told you earlier, my mother was ordained since 1971. And she was ordained in Dharma Gupta Nikaya from Taiwan. And uh, Venerable Dhammavati, the leading nun here, she was also ordained by the Taiwanese group in 1988. I was there. I was there at her ordination. So I, I kept I kept in touch with all the records coming from Nepal. 
And I know that when she come back to Nepal, she practice according to Theravada. But the ordination is Dharma Gupta. So if she wants to remain as a Pikuni, she has to wear Dharma Gupta robe, which is Chinese robe. Of course, she is not trained to be a Chinese nun. So when she comes back, she would like to be a Theravada Pikuni. But the lineage she got was not Theravada lineage. You see, so that is difficult. So when she came back, so far that I heard, I might be wrong. The monks did not agree. So she went back and she started putting on her Anakarika robe, the pink one. The pink one is a statement that you are Upasika. You are not ordained. You know, the pink color is associated with being Karawas. Karawas means one who, who is still in the home, not the homeless one, still in the home. But in Nepal, I see that many of these Anakarikas, they are very capable, very efficient. Why not move up to the stage of Pikuni? You know, that, that was my question. But of course, when I come here, I realize that there are many intricate, many sensitive issues that that's why I said it's a Nepali themselves. Nepali nuns themselves has to decide what they want to do. Again, please put the button right. Not when you start the first button, you have to put it right. Otherwise, you keep on the long line and you end up having to redo it again. I would suggest that they have to take Theravada ordination. Because at the time, in 1988, Theravada ordination was not there. But now Theravada ordination is already there. Let's start, even though you may lose many years. But losing many years is your practice. Uh, I think we, you know, we mean, means uh, the Pikunis themselves, we cannot live alone. We have to depend on the lay people. We have to depend on the lay people. So this is working together, working together. Yes. I think it is important that the lay people themselves also have to study. You know, like someone like you may study, focus on your academic. You need academic backup to be Theravada Pikunis. You need academic backup. You need to go back to the text and try to understand that what we have understand as it is, is not what the Buddha said. We have to come back and talk much about, uh, how to say, deconstruction. Uh, deconstruction is deconstructing the, the common belief, you know, to see that the real message is not like that. So maybe we should bring out another book about deconstructing the Buddhist belief in Nepal. Not, not in Nepal, not in Nepal, but uh, in general we have been moving and then so many seminars, conferences, you know. Actually, the World Council of Churches sponsored uh, uh, a conference so that the leading, uh, leading uh, academics of all the Christianity, uh, Islam and Buddhists come together and discuss about the women's issue. They have done that, you know, and we learn from each other a great deal. I, I remember one time they talk about where did we derail? Derail means like the train, you know, derail, fall off the rail. So where did we derail? In all the three religions, major religions, we realize that we have been derailed from very early. <laughs> Uh, yes, that is one of, one of the reasons, many reasons, is to, to, to strengthen Buddhist women wherever we go to, to organize conference. The very first one started in Bodh Gaya, 1987. That was when I was also co-founder, three of us, Venerable Karma Lekshe Somo, uh, uh, Aya Kema. Aya Kema is a, a German. Uh, and myself. At that time, I was still a lay person. Ayakema passed away in 1997. 
So uh, only Karma Lekshya Sumo continued on. So she's very capable. She's very capable. Now uh, she is also a professor in San Diego. So this, this conference itself is a space where people come and tell the stories, the difficulties or the success of the women in different parts of the world. You know? So that's how the, the, the Nepali nuns can get the space to talk about. And uh, Guru Ma, Venerable uh, Dhammavati, actually started that Lumbini, you know, and, and we, one time, Sakyatida had a conference there at, at, her, at her Arama. I would love to see that. Why, you know, because I feel so connected. This is the place where Buddha was born. And the place where the Buddha was born should have the fourfold Buddhist communities. It is called a Machima Pradesh, a central country, only when you have the fourfold Buddhist communities. And this is where Nepali are still lacking. The second one, the second Parisat, you know, Piku, pikuni, you still lack pikuni. So when you sit on a chair with three legs, it's wobbly, wobbly, you know, you are afraid that you might fall. So as a mother takes care of her children, a pikuni can also take care of the other half of the society and society will come to the full. You know, the, the pilgrimage from Thailand, they come to Nepal, but when they say they come to Nepal, it's only that border, you know. Uh, they just cross Sonauli and then turn to, ne uh, to, to Lumbini, that's all. And then they would go back, they would go back. They don't come to Nepal as a whole country like this. Uh, my paper that I thought I might present here, but I changed my mind. I talk about the energy, the female energy in, in uh, Nepal. One of the topic I mentioned is, this is the place, Lumbini is the place where the Queen Maya gave birth to her son. But now people said this is the place where the Buddha was born. Why don't you talk about his mother? At that time he was not even a Buddha yet. So we should, f the focus is shifted. The focus should be, this is the place where Maha Maya, Ma Maya Devi gave birth to her son. When you say that, when people go and pray, you are praying to this energy, this mother energy. Mm -hmm. And this mother energy, every one of us need mother energy. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that we should not shift to the Buddha. Mm -hmm. At that time, he was only a baby, not yet the Buddha. He became Buddha 35 years after that. So Lumbini should be kept as Maya Devi, the person who gave birth to, to the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And it was Maya Devi. Vihara for a long time. I was, I had an opportunity in 1962 to actually see the old Maya Devi, small Maya Devi Vihara, where people go and, and there is so much religious energy. But now it has become archaeological museum where that part, that religious part is lost. Mm 